Hello, I'm Dr. David Boyd, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. Let me briefly address two reasons why human rights are relevant to the conversation about biodiversity. The first reason is universal. All human rights depend on healthy ecosystems and biodiversity. Think of pollinators and the right to food. Think of coastal mangroves as a defense against deadly storms, thus protecting the right to life. And think about healthy forests protecting us from zoonotic diseases. The second reason is that all too often con conservation actions have violated human rights, evicting people from their homes and communities, criminalizing traditional lifestyles, even beating, raping, and murdering Indigenous peoples and members of local communities for merely trying to exercise and defend their rights. Surely we can all agree that in the 21st century, this is completely unacceptable. Yet these types of rights violations are ongoing in the creation and management of protected areas in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and beyond. I recently published a report on rights-based approaches to conserving, protecting, and restoring biodiversity with the goal of influencing the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. My brief had three main conclusions. Number one, human rights-based approaches must be highlighted and incorporated throughout the global biodiversity framework. Based on human rights law, this is an obligation, not an option. Human rights should be front and center in legislation and national biodiversity strategy and action plans. This includes all processes to designate new protected areas and expand existing areas, both on land and water, to meet the 30% by 2030 target. This includes planning, management, and enforcement. And this also includes, critically, the financing of conservation actions. Over the course of the next decade, hundreds of billions of dollars will be invested in biodiversity conservation and nature-based solutions to the climate crisis. It's critical that these investments be carefully screened to ensure that they respect, protect, fulfill, and promote human rights. The second key point is that the rights of Indigenous peoples and other rural rights holders have to be prioritized. By this, I'm referring not only to free prior and informed consent, but more broadly to the title, rights, and governance responsibilities of Indigenous peoples and other rural rights holders. These rights must be incorporated in law, implemented, and respected. And the third key point is that the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment should be incorporated in the framework, and measurable targets related to its implementation should be included. We recently saw the historic recognition by the UN Human Rights Council of everyone's right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And the unique aspect of this alone among human rights is that it can be used to protect both human health and ecosystem health. Recognizing the right to a healthy environment empowers everyone, including children, youth, and women, to engage in nature conservation. Now, UN resolutions are not legally binding, but they are catalysts for change. After the 2010 resolutions on the rights to water and sanitation, a number of countries, including Costa Rica, Fiji, Mexico, Slovenia, and Tunisia, added the right to, of, right to water to their constitutions, their highest and strongest laws. Other nations, from Colombia to France, added this right to legislation. And most importantly, nations accelerated efforts to fulfill the right to water. Mexico has extended clean drinking water to more than 1,000 rural communities. Slovenia has prioritized access to drinking water for Roma communities living in informal settlements. And Canada has worked with indigenous communities to bring safe drinking water to more than 115 communities that in some cases had gone for decades without. The bottom line is that we know rights-based approaches to conservation work. Lands where indigenous peoples, title and rights are recognized are high in biodiversity, high in forest protection, and high in carbon storage. In Namibia, community conservation areas have led to larger wildlife populations, economic benefits, and increased human well-being. A marine protected area near Cabo Pulmo in Mexico, which was designated at the request of the local community, has helped rebuild fish populations and generated a thriving tourism sector. Indigenous protected and conserved areas in Canada and Australia are protecting biodiversity, reviving cultures, and generating economic benefits for Indigenous peoples. So, friends and colleagues, it's absolutely imperative that the 2020 Global Biodiversity Framework put human rights 
at the heart of conservation. And as I said earlier, this is an obligation, not an option for governments. Thank you very much. And please keep up the great work.